Yeah, Graham Marcher, how are you? I haven't oh, seen you for a while. No, indeed. I'm very well. Thank you, Jeremy, and thank you for having me on. No, 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 it's no. A pleasure. It's a great pleasure, a great honour to have you here. One of the great investigative journalists of our city, probably the country, and, 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 and of course, all of the current affairs programmes that you produced. Mm. Yes, yes. Unfortunately, um, the, the health and welfare of current affairs programmes is um, diminished significantly. Why did that happen? Oh, look, you know, I mean, apart from apart from the, the financial side of that things, mm. in terms of, you know, the, the, legal, the legal issues um, and, and just the cost of running these programs, um, there's just been so much streaming um, competition yeah. that the audiences have, have, you know, gone elsewhere, but also the... You know, the advertising dollar has gone elsewhere as well, which um, has been true for, all, you know, all of the media platforms. Yeah, but maybe the talent has gone elsewhere as well, because when you think of the work that you guys would put in on a story and it would break and it would be front page. Well, that's true. But, I, you know, quite frankly, I think um, the interest of the public has changed. You know, and the, probably the demographic of the public's changed. Mm. Um, you know, the people of our generation, you know, we'd get our teeth into a story and we'd follow it through and we'd mm. take an interest. But we live in a society where, you know, um, anything longer than about, you know, 30 seconds <laughs> is starting to get boring. Mm. Um, and it's hard to cut through. I mean, clearly things... That there's, there's been a, a resurgence or a, a yeah well a resurgence in interest in true crime, mm. um, but you know if you don't produce it in a way that the audience you know wants to digest it, then mm. um, you know it, it's a hard sell. And, it, and from a you know uh, it, it's it's okay to produce these things as a as a drama series or, a, you know, um, a sort of reenactments and so on. But to do that on a nightly basis as a current affairs program That's or right. on a weekly basis, it's yeah. very, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Is this true all over the world? Well, I think the I, – I, I think it is. I think the, um, the same financial dynamics um, are happening everywhere. Um, you know, the cost I – mean, when you think about it, Jeremy, you know, and we used to take this absolutely as, you know, a, a law of nature is that in the morning someone would drive past and throw a rolled up piece of newspaper over your front fence. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, I mean, what a, what a, a cumbersome way, what mm -hmm. an expensive way of communicating with people. You know, they've got to chop trees, they've got to build... You know, mm -hmm. printing presses. Worked for a long time. Worked for, and, <laughs> and every night, you know, some slave has to, you know, sweat over the presses and, and once the journalists have written them, mm. um, and, and then a guy gets up at two o'clock in the morning and drives up the streets. Yeah. You know, I mean, you compare that to, you know, our, our modern communication systems yeah. and it just seems absurd. You know, it's horse and cart stuff. I know, but it's something uh, comforting about uh, reading a newspaper because you can go back to it. I don't know. It's it's, it's probably what you get used to. But, um, you know, the whole generation changes. It reminds me of that song about rock and roll, I gave you all the best years of my life, mm. and the song about the man who he, he was there and his music was great and they loved him. Mm. And he he was so involved, he didn't notice that the world was changing, moving, moving on. on. Yeah, moving on. But isn't that just the way of things? Um, and I think the the pace of that movement is is accelerated, and that's that's what makes um, living in the current age both well, frankly, bewildering. <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, Maybe it's a question of picking the next big thing before you are reacting to it. You're actually there on top of it. Oh, I think that's you know that's true of any um, you know any area of of, of life, whether it's communications yeah. or yeah, yeah. you know 
um, fashion or, or music or whatever. I yeah. mean, if you can if you can see into the future, or at least you've got a feeling about or a vision. Yes. Because you know um, the most valuable thing in in life um, is is good ideas. Mm. You know, um, in in the you know in the context of what we're talking about, yes. good ideas and creativity, yeah. and uh, those people who can, um, you know, w- see the wave coming. I mean, I was talking to a guy yesterday who's actually a biological scientist and he was talking about a new way of making vaccines and he said because the the pharmaceutical industry um and there are parallels with the motor car vehicle industry the steel industry the whatever media industry um has is dominated by four or five you know big pharma and they have old techniques and they have have old sort of methods and they have a huge investment in this laboratory infrastructure Mm -hmm. but there are modern techniques which could cut straight through that speed up the production of vaccines and and render all of that obsolete and you know that's just an area you don't you don't think of normally but it's not dissimilar to what we're talking about in terms of media or mm-hmm. um, you know communications. Yeah, yeah. Seems to me that uh, you look back through history, you find that the uh, various um, innovations, the breakthroughs, mm-hmm. things like that, come as a s- side bar, comes as a, 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 a side benefit. They were looking for something to do, such and such, and. Out of that experiment or out of that pursuit, a couple of other things pop. Very often that's the case, you know, that, um, uh, you know, genius by accident. Um, But Mm. you have to be looking and you have to recognise what you stumble upon Mm. uh, Mm. as being, you know, worth pursuing. So uh, it does have a few prerequisites, but certainly, you know, that's, that's, you know, yeah, yeah, in the case. Yeah, they were looking over here for something, and then uh, the, the byproduct of that was Velcro. Yeah, yeah. or uh, <laughs> a mouse knocked over a test tube and it yes, rocked yes. out and <laughs> mixed with something yeah. else. Sort of just the um, what do the Americans call it? Fortuosity. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Did you ever meet Rupert Murdoch? Uh, no, I didn't. No, no, mm. no. It's interesting, isn't it, that he's yeah. finally uh, decided to. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Past the the baton to Lachlan. Yes. Um, gee, that wasn't very quick, was it? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's he's sort of uh, been doing it for a while. Yeah, I guess I guess way. he's he's feeling Rupert Murdoch is feeling comfortable about yeah. hand handing it over. But, but you would have had contact with him. You would have known him. Yeah, I I met him in Sydney um, when they were launching something. I think it might have been the. Uh, Oh, it was a because uh, 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 the uh, the Australian didn't actually start out. Mm-hmm. This was his grand vision, I think, to have a a great broadsheet national newspaper. Yeah, and it, it didn't sort of start out that way. I think it began with the um, Sunday Australian, which was even before the Weekend Australian. Right, right. And there was a, a, a launch there in Holt Street, and he was hosting a party. And uh, I met him then, mm. and uh, he's a he's a quite a remarkable man. Oh, no doubt about that. Yeah, um, I, I imagine there are many many books written about him. He's got people who love him, people who hate him. Mm. Uh, well, you know, he was he was absolutely instrumental in um, in pursuing the uh, the wrongful. Uh, conviction of Rupert Max Stewart oh, and, yes. and, and he you know that was one of his causes that, yeah. that he backed in and, and and at great personal um personal risk because it, at one stage he was going to be charged with uh, I think it was criminal defamation uh, against police um, because they objected so strongly to the fact that you know, he'd he'd taken this stand, and um, 
you know, it's kind of uh, in some ways an unpopular, um, you know, championing of a, of a mm. um, you know, cause, which you wouldn't, you know, in modern times necessarily uh, relate back to Rupert Murdoch, but, you know, mm. as a... As it wouldn't a, be a popular cause. Though. Not a popular cause no. at all. Um, and, no. and so, you know, that, that sort of always made me wonder, did he, in some ways, did he kind of lose his way a bit in With terms of his moral, story? Well, no, but just his moral compass in some ways, you know, did the size of his empire, yeah. you know, take him away from, you know, the, the sort of proper form of journalism yeah. to, you know, uh, a form of journalism which was about sustaining his power or increasing his power. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But he clearly had, you know, strong... But you, you, do, you do need, I would imagine, to have um, causes. You you would have to have things that you went after in high dudgeon trying to get justice for, for somebody. Yeah. I mean, the, the stories that you would have done in that area... Um, what are the ones about which you are most proud? Do you, do you have a favourite or favourites? Uh, I don't have a, a, a favourite. I mean, they they all they're, they're in there. They're all different in their own way. Possibly, you know, just opening up the whole can of worms of um, uh, institutionalised child abuse was yeah. was one because it, um, you know, for a very long time, uh, it was an absolute taboo to talk about. Uh, child abuse at all. In fact, I, when I started Today Tonight um, mm-hmm. in 1995, one of, the, one of the, the messages from the then EP was no pedophile stories. <laughs> Why? Because that, uh, they're too hot to handle or just not, not box office? Why? Well, not box office. You know, people don't want to hear about that gruesome stuff. <laughs> you know, it's too yucky. Yeah. And, but as it turned out, you know, we, we did go down that track um, and it was, it was one of those, you know, you talk about fortuosity. Um, we came across a, a, a guy who as a child had been um, had been abused within government institutions yeah. and he had pursued a case against the Crown and he was incredibly fortunate that his file had not been destroyed. Mm. Um, and and so he had you know documented evidence that he had, was being released on weekends to the custody of abusers, and and in one fact one uh, uh, one notation was uh, Kai has gone off on the weekend with his homosexual friends, and he was ten. <laughs> And that, 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 didn't, that didn't ring any bells. No, it didn't seem to, but it was written down. How remarkable. Yeah. So when we came across that and he, he came to us, um, we went, this is, this is extraordinary and this must be the tip of an iceberg. Yeah. And, you know, there have been people quietly kind of shouting in the background, yeah. but nobody wanted to talk to them. Um, and effectively, what it, what we discovered is that in South Australia, and this may you know relate to other places, but in South Australia, there was a law. Uh, I mean, prior to nineteen eighty three, um, there was a statute of limitations three years on sexual abuse. Hmm. So as long as you got away with it for three years, you were home free. God. Um, and when they repealed that law in 85, they basically said, oh, yes, but we'll let all the previous cases remain under the old law. So anything past 85, there was no limitation. Yeah. But there was this period of time, you know, from 1980 backwards, yeah. where there was this limitation. Well, hard to imagine that that wasn't something by design. I remember. Well, that's the that is the the question. Yeah. Well, I remember. Oh, I can't remember the year, but um, Harold Salisbury was the mm-hmm. police commissioner. Yep. And he, um, for some reason, I think his secretary was called Barbara, and we would have uh, with the morning program mm-hmm. on DN mm-hmm. 
regular contact mm. with him, and he was very uh, 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 friendly with the media. He handled the media very well yeah. for a police commissioner. Anyway, he um, uh, rang me one day and said, uh, a commissioner would like to have afternoon tea with you. And I said, oh, well, what an honour. Yes, I'd, 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 when? And so down I went to Angus Street, uh, up to the... Um, uh, penthouse, mm. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, he we'd had conversations on the phone, but he he wouldn't know me from Adam. And I sat there wondering what all this was about, mm. and he, he, he started to talk about uh, the premier, right, and in the most extraordinary terms. Yeah, you know, he he said. Uh, he kept on referring to that little poofter down in, oh dear. <laughs> in North Terrace. Yeah. And uh, I don't know where the relationship went bad, because I think they brought him over from England as a very uh, illustrious senior they did. police officer. Well, in fact, uh, Dunstan handpicked him in London. What? Uh, it didn't. Uh, something must have gone wrong with the relationship, because uh, it was shortly after that that... Uh, the Premier and I think the Attorney General at the time mm. marched down to Ang Street mm. and bodily threw him out of the building or yeah. sacked him. Yeah. Sacked him. Yeah. Uh, so there were in fascinating things going on yeah. in Adelaide that, that were kind of under the radar. Yeah, they were. Under the surface. And it must have all been connected with things like, uh, what was that guy's name? George. The one they threw in the uh, oh, river? George Duncan. George yeah. Duncan, yeah, 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 the, yeah, 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 yeah. The lawyer. Yeah. Um, uh, academic. Academic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then there was all that stuff with the family. Mm. Yeah. And you you heard countless rumours about uh, who was family and who wasn't their well, family. Indeed. Um, and then there was the strange, you know, connect. I think connected to that was the strange murder of uh, Darren Stevenson, the lawyer. Oh, God, one in the freezer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we have a, a very good but different. <laughs> we have a really rich uh, history of bizarre crime, we do. don't we? We do. Bodies in barrels? Yeah, well, we do. We yeah. do. I mean, I, I, I always sort of shudder a bit that South Australia gets characterised by that because I think that, um, you know, there are bizarre things happen everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but know, why us? <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, we, you know, my boss, my boss at uh, Seven Network used to ring me. He's now deceased, uh, the the legendary David Lee. Oh, I didn't know David Lee had died. Yeah, yeah, he died last year. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, yes. Yeah. And he, he'd ring me up, you know, because I, I, I'd known him for years yeah. through Channel 9 and so on, so yeah. he, he had you know, some affection for me. And he, he'd ring up and he'd go, Arch, how's life going in the home of the shallow bush grave? <laughs> <laughs> Cruel but funny. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, he was, uh, David Leckie was married to Sky. Sky, yes. Yeah, she was, she was a lovely lady. I used to know her and work with her when she was doing stuff with, I think, David Jones. Yeah. Mm. Oh dear. Mm. Oh well. But but to go back to the original part of the story, I mean, what what emerged from all that was um, the exposure of the fact that these kids were under state care, you know, in the care of the minister in yeah. these various orphanages, you know, state owned or state supported, and and they were basically being sort of systematically abused and there was no you know there was no uh, nobody it was a it was a sort of willful blindness turn yes, to it. yes 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 and and of course all of those stories we we uh, characterized the story or at least titled the stories the takeaway children because that's effectively what they were people would just come and take them for the weekend and they'd be shipped off to you know, foster, God knows. foster care and, yeah, and yeah. Know, that were abusers. Um, and, uh, you know, all of that eventually uh, resulted in the Mulligan Inquiry, which... Oh, uh, yes, I remember that. Um, um, which, uh, um, you know, exposed at least uh, the numbers that we're talking about. I mean, there were thousands. 
yeah. and uh, and it drew a, in the end a, a, a government apology, um, mm. a, a compensation scheme, which I'm sure you know most of the vi- victims would consider to be inadequate. But it was there at least um, uh, where it hadn't been before. Mm. And in fact, the guy that started it all. Kai, the the guy who we did the original story on, did a number of stories on, was on the 14th of June this year, was personally apologised to Mm. in Parliament. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and and he has been very courageous in doing, you know, these things and and supporting other people. Um, So, you know, that that's uh, an area... Um, unfortunately, you know, it's a grim area um, or people are exposed, you know, the sort of more depressing the whole thing becomes. But it, nevertheless, it's one of those areas of subterranean life that needs to be exposed. So, yeah, uh, sunlight is, is a yeah. great uh, antiseptic, but yeah. uh, did anything come out of the Mulligan Inquiry? Did anyone go to jail? Was was anybody... Uh, no? No? So what's the difference well, between well, an inquiry and a cover-up? Well, that, that's not entirely true. No, I think that running um, currently with the, with the Mulligan Inquiry were... Um, were criminal investigations, mm. and quite a lot of people have, have have actually gone to jail. I'm not sure whether it's directly as a result of evidence adduced in the inquiry, yeah. but certainly, you know, the police have been very active. And in fact, Kai's abuser, who was, and you'll, you'll know this name, I think, Rick Marshall. Oh, yes, 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 because he was involved in detainment. Yeah. Was he not? Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, he was the, he was the, the, the primary abuser of, of Kai, he went to jail. All right, right, um, right, right. And uh, I think he's passed away now. But so there, what, there, there has been, there has been, um, you know, results and the police uh, are much more proactive, you know, these days on that sort of stuff um, and have special squats and us, you know, tr- properly trained. So there's been great sort of, you know, advancements, even if, as I say, even though it's a, an area of life that, you know, is, is rather depressing and grim. Yes. Um, you know, it, it needed the scab, scab ripped off it. And, yeah. and I, yeah. I'm yeah. pleased that we were able to play a, a role in, you know, ventilating some of that. Yeah, well, we missed that uh, part that you played. I, I think that uh, state current affairs program, because I think if you look at the whole national scene, they just as soon ignore South Australia and, and Adelaide. Well, that that's true. And it's very difficult, you know, um, there is what I sort of call a South Australian syndrome, which, which is more uh, uh, inflicted on us by these sort of Narcissism of the bigger bigger cities. Oh yes, you know, right. and the self importance of Sydney and Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Um, so some of our you know good works, some of our good works didn't get the kind of national exposure they should have. I don't know. I can remember when we weren't a branch office mm-hmm. when uh, when we were the um, golly what were we the Athens of the South. That's right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and you know. Uh, we were talking about Rupert Murdoch. News Limited was head office Absolutely. here in Adelaide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these days, it's. Um, I, I heard them uh, of a night talking about it being headquartered in um, uh, New York. It's actually Delaware, I think. Is it? Yeah. 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 Tex, Texas. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Delaware with 35,000 people, and I think it's 650 million <laughs> offices. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that would be. <laughs> I, th- I think you were going to ask me about uh, the Peter Liddy. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we were talking about sort of the uh, um, underbelly of mm. Adelaide and mm. some of the stuff about which most of us would certainly, for our city and state's sake, not be very proud of. Um, but the uh, Peter Liddy story, you were very involved in that. I mean, you must be a little bit like a, a dog with a bone <laughs> you get hold of a story. You just well, keep going until you've... You've, you've got it. Well, 
you know, you, you get a feeling in, with certain <laughs> stories. You've got to, you get a feeling that there is something there mm-hmm. um, and that, you, you know, it's just a matter of turning the right key if you persist. Yeah. Uh, Do you ever have, did you ever have trouble with management where they would say, um, that's too hot? No, don't, don't, don't go, don't go there. No, I, I, I did, I never had that problem. Um, you know, they were very supportive both locally and nationally, um, of investigations. The only time they got a little nervous was uh, where there were legal ramifications that oh, yeah. came from these things, which which in effect are inethic, yeah. uh, inevitable. And I remember Peter Meekin, who was the, the sort of doyen of hmm. uh, producers of current affairs and television uh, programs, was said to me once that... Um, uh, that legally, you know, I'm unsustainable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was an interesting fellow. He used to be my boss at Channel 10. Oh, ago. was he? Yeah, he's still yeah. going, you know. He's back at Channel 10. Oh. Yeah, he's still Well, going. I think they need him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think they do. But he's, he, he'll, he'll never, he'll, he'll die on the job, I think. Yeah. He's passionate. But anyway, well, the, the Liddy thing was really a, due to my connections through the the life-saving movement and so I was able to contact um, the young guy who originally blew the whistle on Liddy and uh, at that time we're talking you know this during the 90s um, the police were not interested um, they didn't have a uh, an abuse sort of section they didn't have the means or really the interest in pursuing it. Um, and and Liddy was a magistrate, you know. He was one of the untouchables, if you like. Yeah. Uh, and so this young guy um, was basically cast adrift. In fact, he believes he was actually assaulted by police at some stage who had been uh, instructed by Liddy mm. to mm. shut this guy down. Um, but I mean, Liddy came undone when he when he bribed or attempted to bribe one of his victims, and that was when it elevated from allegations to you know serious evidence that there was something to hide here. But people would have known about all of this. There would have been uh, a cover up. Oh, um, the people knew for years. Well, oh, yes, absolutely. They knew yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. all of that began when he was a, a, a lifesaver uh, teaching uh, kids. Yeah, well, it happened right the way through from the 70s and 80s when he, mm-hmm. he was in football clubs as a, a sort of coach and support. Yes. Um, he was in the lifesaving movement. Um, you know, he, he went to, as these people do, to where their young vulnerable kids and and particularly kids from broken homes yeah because they're looking for a father figure and they are the ones that you know are easiest to target and that's you know that's very often where his his targets were wouldn't you think though that uh, there would be uh, all the warning signs with very experienced police and other social workers who would recognize the scenario for what it is mm. and do something about it. Well, you know, the other thing that protected Liddy was that he was the the chairman of the police disciplinary tribunal. Hmm. So as a magistrate, uh, he had that position. And of course, he knew where all the bodies were buried in terms of police officers who you yeah. know, misbehaved. Yes. And so in a sense... Um, you, if you if yeah. you started investigating him, you did so at your peril. Do you think there is a, a, a family? Do you think here in South Australia there is and still is a network of these people? Oh, I think you know. There's no doubt that there's there's networks because that's how these these systems operate. You know, they, yeah. they work um, as as networks. Whether it's passing child porn or you know or grooming. Yes, yes, and passing them around. Um, 
you know, the, the family is a um, is an interesting concept because it suggests a sort of hardcore group that we're involved in all of these things. Yeah. I, I think it was something of a a looser um, kind of group that passed through each other's company, and there might have been a hardcore centre. Yeah. Um, and I don't know, you know, how many would be involved in that, but certainly. Um, the kind of crimes that were committed could not have been committed by a, a one person on their own. You know, clearly, no, no, Bevan no, Spencer no. von Einem didn't, on his own, do these things. And he's still in jail, isn't he? He is still in jail. But yeah. never never talked? No, no, he's never. Did Liddy ever talk? No, 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 denied it, uh, still would deny it. He's still in jail. Um, he wouldn't be having a good time, I wouldn't think, in jail. Very, very difficult. Um, given his, you know, uh, his his background to uh, to survive in jail, most of it would have been sent, spent in segregation. Will he will he get out, or they just well, keep him there? Well, I mean, personally, I, I think um, you know if you've got a sentence uh, and you serve that sentence, there comes a time when you should be yeah, released from prison. Yes. You know, incarcerating people indefinitely, yeah. uh, I think, is inhumane. For the term of his natural life yeah. doesn't exist anymore, well, does it? Well, no, but there are, you know, there are rules in, I mean, certainly in uh, in some jurisdictions, you know, um, that say this person will never be eligible for parole. Mm. Um, and now, Liddy's not in that situation. He, he's done his 18 years non-parole period. In fact, probably done 20 22 years now. So why isn't he out? Well, he appeared. He appealed after 18 years. And, of course, yes. you know, very unpopular for a parole board yes. and an attorney general yes. to um, to let this guy out. Yes. Because uh, where's the political um, mm. advantage? And what about the political fallout? Well, that would come, mm. obviously. Mm. Um, mm. But, you know, I think if you have sentencing laws, mm. you know, um, we should stick to them. Who would want to be the chairman of the parole board? It would be a very terrible, terrible well, job. Unfortunately, the, you know, the chairman of the parole, the presiding office has been there for 40 years. And yes, I, think, I, know. I think, I, I don't think, <laughs> well, she wants so. the job, which is that nobody well, else wants the job. No. Well, um, <laughs> you know, who knows whether that's the case. But yeah. I, I think, you know, the legislation should be, change so you know it's a limited term yes. and this refreshment as yes. it should be in so many of these positions. No I, I totally agree uh, we were talking about um, uh, Don Dunstan mm. and uh, those really interesting Harold Salisbury mm. years um, the idea of, of having someone like you a terrier mm. Quite prepared to kick down the door, blazing cameras. Uh, <laughs> I remember we had a couple of journos like that. Yeah, in the newsroom. Well, Mike McEwen would have been one. Mike McEwen and Des Ryan. Yeah, that's right. And you talked about the backing that your company gave mm. you to do the work, which is very stressful. I don't know how you sort of go home at night after you know working on a, a couple of these cases for which you are famous. Um, but I remember clearly Des Ryan and Mike McKeown, they would stand up at a press conference with uh, the Premier and ask him about publicly certain indiscretions. Mm -hmm. And someone whose name I can't quite remember, who was a well-known heroin addict, mm -hmm. uh, who was working as an advisor to Don Dunstan in his office. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. Uh, John Ceruto. Ceruto. Yes, yeah. that's the guy. Yeah. John Ceruto. Yeah. Uh, not with us anymore. I think he died of an overdose. He did. he did. Yeah. Well, instead of the management backing Des Ryan mm. and Mike McEwen, they, I, I remember Paul Linkson said to them both and quite publicly with everyone in the station, mm. you will stop harassing the Premier. Mm. You will leave this alone. But hang on, this is the greatest story 
that South Australia... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, now he said, look, I, we have been read the Riot Act from Macquarie Broadcasting in Sydney. You are not to alienate the Premier. Because the Premier had gone to the head of uh, Fairfax, who owned the station at the time, and complained bitterly about these two, these two bulldogs who were constantly, aggravatingly chasing him. But, you know, it's, it's not always easy to be a... I guess a Catherine Graham when you've got uh, uh, Bernstein and Woodward who come mm. to you and say, "Look, we've got the goods on the president," and you you say, "Well, uh, I think we'd better leave that alone," or you say, "I'll back you all the way." I would like to be on the side of the the proprietor who said, "I will back you all the way." Yeah, and she did. She did, which was extraordinary. And a remarkable woman. I had the honour of talking to her. Oh, did you really? Yeah, yeah. And she, she, uh, she had come to that job because her husband was the head of the Washington Post, and he killed himself for I it's, don't know what yes, reason it was. Yeah. And it was thrust upon her. She was not a journalist. Mm. She knew nothing about running a newspaper, but she took to it. Um, whereas a, a lesser person would have probably sold it or or, or hired somebody to do it. No, she did it herself. Remarkable woman. There's um, a great movie about that. Um, uh, like, for life of me, I can't remember the, the, the name. I think Michael Keaton was in it. Uh, was it the Bernstein Woodward uh, story? Or yeah, was it? yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yes, she was very courageous. What would you be doing today if you were running a current affairs program? Well, you know... Uh, well, I'd be I'd be looking into the ICAC um, uh, material. Yeah, I'd yeah. Be doing. Each state seems to have one. We've got a federal yeah. one now. They all seem to be a little bit different. Well, they do, they do, um, and uh, you know they, you know, the presence of an ICAC, I think, is is good in the sense that they are a discouragement to you know public service corruption. But I think what happens is you you invest these organisations with enormous powers, which you know in extreme cases are, are required. Mm -hmm. But when you give people power, you mm -hmm. know there is a great temptation to use it. How should it be? Uh, you wouldn't want it to be a star chamber. Well, we, yeah. Well, that, that, see, that that's the problem, and I don't think there's any clear solution to the problem of um, investigating people in private to protect their, um, you know, their reputations. They don't. You want to don't want to cause needless damage mm -hmm. if there's no, as it turns out, evidence that they've done anything wrong. Mm. But what happens with um, those star chamber mm. investigations is the concept of natural justice mm. is at risk. Do these people get represented properly? Do they get a chance to uh, present their, their side of the story? Mm. And because it's behind closed doors, we just don't know. The alternative is to have public hearings as they've had in New South Wales, mm. and while there's transparency. Um, people are very often put to the torch mm, mm. Um, in the investigative process um, when, in the end, it's discovered they haven't done anything wrong. So yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure what the the balance is in in that, um, you know, the, yeah, that yeah, divide. Yeah. They've knocked off a few premiers in uh, New South Wales. But the, the last one, Gladys Berejiklian, and I found that was just absolutely shocking. She, uh, it was announced that she was being investigated. Uh, uh, she resigned from being premier, and I think it was probably two years before they came back yeah. and said, uh, "We find you uh, guilty of uh, corruption, but you won't be charged because there's not enough evidence. Mm -hmm. There's enough evidence to ruin your life, mm -hmm. but not enough to say that you've done anything wrong." Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is, you know, very peculiar. Um, and grossly unfair. Yeah, I think so. 
I think so. Or as Des Ryan said, grossly imp- – oh, no, no, because actually the Premier used yes. to use it. It's grossly improper. Correct. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> but, um, yeah, look, I mean, you know, she she was naive in her relationships. She mm. got hooked up with a, a serial scoundrel. Yes. Um, and, you know – I suppose you could say, well, we expect a premier not to be so naive. But yeah. um, well, there was that song, you know, called "What I Did for Love." Exactly. I mean, matters of the heart are, mm. you know, are, are, are different. Um, and uh, I mean, I think she was a very decent premier. I think she was too, and a decent person. Yeah. But you know, it's all about proportionality. You know, does the does the uh, the crime justify the punishment? Does the mm. suggestion of corruption justify the means to uncover it? Mm. Um, and, and what we've seen in South Australia is, I think, a, an overuse of the powers. And, in you know, in a number of cases, um, the, the actual breaking of laws in the investigation process. Now, when you've got a corruption anti-corruption body who itself is acting unlawful in the pursuit of its goal, I think, you know, you've got a serious problem. Yeah. And that's what's that's what's been the case in South Australia. Got any books coming out? Anything? Well, I've got one sitting on the shelf waiting for a high court decision, uh-huh. which is uh, the story of Derek Bromley, who's been in jail now. He's in his 40th year in prison um, <laughs> and has... Partly through, well, through the work we did on the Keogh case and the changing of the law in that case, um, mm. managed to get an appeal before the High Court. So that was held in, in May of this year. I yeah. uh, went to Canberra and sat through the High Court um, appeal. And uh, we're sitting waiting for the result. And I've got the book ready to launch, but I don't have the last chapter. Uh, <laughs> it's being written by five l- judges. judges. Yeah. Yeah. The Ke- Keo case was interesting, wasn't it? I mean, how, how do you think she died? Oh, I, I think it was, uh, I mean, it was an a- accident. I think she slipped and fell, um, possibly fainted. Uh, yeah. I I don't know that. I mean, I, I hate being being put in a position where I've got to, say, make a black and white statement about it. Well, you can't. You weren't there. I wasn't there. No, 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 no. But Henry Keogh, I think they gave him, they put him away. How long was he away for? He, he served He served 20 years. 20 um, years, and yeah. they gave him, I think, $2 million or $3 million compensation. Two and a half, yeah. Two and a half, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, well, you know, uh, I mean, he, he was jailed at the sort of prime of his life, life in terms of his career. Yes. Um, it caused enormous pain to his family and friends. Yeah. Um, Why did they think he did it? What was the motive for oh, well, it? The motive was financial. They He had a whole lot of insurance policies. So he was an oh, insurance... that's not a good look. No, it's not a good look. And, and you know, there was, there was sufficient circumstantial evidence <laughs> to investigate. <laughs> um, but it became, I think, you know, tunnel vision... Yeah, yeah. And, of course, you know, the notorious um, forensic pathologist, Dr. Manock, who was oh, unqualified. Yes. How, did, how did he get away with that for years and years well, and years? Well, 30 years. 30 years, God. See, that's another sort of uh, indication of what has been, I think, the real issue with South Australia and that it has been the willful blindness of cases like that that no. we just do not want to know because it is too embarrassing. Mm. We too embar- Too many people have hitched their wagon to that, you know, th- that um, horse and we're not going to we're not going to uh, shoot it. Well, just hide it in plain vision. Hide it in plain sight. No yeah, one will look. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> and that's what's happened. But, um, you know, that that's a, a bleak history because, I mean, he did 10,000 autopsies. Yeah. And even... Even the people who employed him had said on oath in the Supreme Court 
we've employed a man who's not qualified to certify cause of death. And he'd he'd been doing it for 40 years. 30 years. years. (laughs) Good God. (laughs) So, you know. Let me know when the book comes out. Yes, I will. Most certainly. Thank you very much for coming in. My pleasure. Sorry about that break in the middle. Um, Technical things do happen at the dining room table. You know, the authenticity (laughs) of it. Well, it is. I mean, if it's nothing else, it's authentic. Indeed. (laughs) Thank you very much. Pleasure to be with you. Graham Archer, ladies and gentlemen.